Ladies and gentlemen, welcome again. We've got four episodes in this unique podcast series, and it's all thank you to our sponsors, Gulfstream. Really, really appreciated Gulfstream. Excellent aircraft. Thank you so much. The legendary G650 and G650ER continue to redefine travel with proven class-leading efficiency and high-speed performance. Fly farther, faster than on any other business aircraft. Saving more than 50 hours a year cruising at Mach.90. Access destinations that matter the most through excellent takeoff and landing performance combined with exceptional range. Relax in the smoothest ride in business aviation, soaring above turbulence that other aircraft must pass through, and enjoy higher fuel efficiency and lower CO2 emissions than the competition, thanks to an advanced wing design and engine technology. For over 60 years, Gulfstream has set the standard for performance, safety, and support. Ladies and gentlemen, friends and listeners, colleagues, have we got a treat for you today. Now, every now and again, something pops up or comes along. You can't take your eyes off it. You want to learn more. You want to listen more. And now I've, I'm lucky enough now to actually meet one of the stars of this particular documentary movie. I'm talking about One More Orbit. OK, and this is a record that we'll, we'll cover in a few minutes but I'm so eagerly wishing to introduce you to somebody who's a right character and um, a man who I know is going to entertain you for the next 40 minutes or so. His name is Captain Hamish Harding. So Hamish, is it all right to call you Hamish or do, would you like me to, to do the captain? <laughs> Hamish works perfectly. Are you sure? You sure? Thank you, Chris. Right. No, that's perfect. Thanks, Chris. Right. Captain will probably pop in and out every in and out every now and again. So first of all, if you can just give a brief explanation as to what One More Orbit is, because I've seen it and I could not take my eyes off it. I loved it and I'm going to keep watching it. But if you can just please tell everybody what exactly was One More Orbit. Certainly. Um, it was a circumnavigation record of the Earth via the North Pole and the South Pole. It's probably the most difficult circumnavigation record uh, in aviation because it involves a very long transition over the South Pole where you can't just land and refuel. Um, and it was to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11 moon landings in 1969. So we actually did it exactly 50 years to the, to the second. Uh, we took off from Cape Canaveral, very close to where Apollo 11 took off on uh, pad 39A and uh, we took off from the space shuttle runway at the same center and went round the Earth in a uh, time that turned out to be a new world record for circumnavigation via the North and South Pole. Yeah, and we'll come to all of the difficulties, especially with the South Pole. But for those listening, uh, it's actually on page 145 of the Guinness Book of Records. And there's several pages there outlining the team and, um, and, and the incredible feat that was carried out. So the previous records... Captain, when was that? Um, there have been three actual records um, that were set uh, originally a long time ago. There was a record set in the 60s by Rockefeller uh, in the Boeing 707. Uh, that was then broken by Pan Am in a 747 SP, the short version, the very long range uh, short uh, section of a 747. And then finally, the record that we actually broke was a global uh, XRS aircraft from Bombardier that was done by uh, the owners of TAG Aviation back in 2008. So the record had stood for about 11 years when we broke it in 2019, July. Fantastic. And and that, that aircraft was part of the uh, Qatar private aviation fleet, yeah? 
Yes, yes, we had a fantastic backup from Qatar Executive. Qatar Executive is the executive aviation charter arm of Qatar Airlines. And they have quite a number of G650s. They have a fantastic support department. So they threw everything at it. When I originally offered the project to uh, Mr. Al Baka, who is the, uh, the chief of Qatar Airways, he sort of embraced it very quickly, but said, we'll only do it if we're absolutely certain we're going to break the record. We'll do whatever it takes, but do not fail. Do not not break the record and bring Qatar's name into disrepute. So we were under a lot of pressure and the team were, were um, threw everything at it. There was over 200 people involved in the end, in the logistics, the filming, and everything associated with it. We couldn't believe how big the project got in the end. Yeah, I worked for Qatar and I lived in Doha, so I know the chief well, and I would imagine, let alone the uh, the, the pressures of the exercise itself, mm. the pressure from the chief himself would have put a little bit of extra motivation into it. Oh, yes, and he turned up to the uh, the, the landing when we were... Yeah. When we were actually coming back in, uh, he was actually circling overhead. I suspect if we hadn't broken the record, he would have diverted somewhere else and disappeared. And but we did break the record, luckily. And uh, I don't want to give away the plot of the uh, of the movie, but uh, it was quite successful. And he did land a few minutes after we landed in his own private jet, and he attended the press conference with us in Cape Canaveral, where we uh, we sort of celebrated the record and uh, kept us going with adrenaline because none of us had really slept very much during that trip. Yep. So we'll come to that now. So, so firstly, firstly, how did you manage to get this to come to being? Because it must have taken an awful lot of planning, a lot of lobbying, a lot of discussion, and uh, a lot of arm twisting. Yes, um, it, it did. It took five years, really, from the original idea to get to a point where we had all this put together, the aircraft lined up, because uh, it turned out to be a lot harder than we expected. There's a lot of issues with um, legalities of doing it, we're going way beyond ETOPS limits. Now, ETOPS is a, is a limit of how many hours you can be away from a diversion airfield. And we were doing it probably at the worst time of year in some ways, because the worst sector by a long way is the one which we did from Mauritius through to Chile over the South Pole. It's a very long sector. There's no divert. We did it in July, yeah. which if you think about it is midwinter in Antarctica. It's pitch black, 24 hours a day. And uh, it's sort of... Um, it was minus 83 at altitude, centigrade that is, and it was about minus 50 to minus 60 on the ground. There was no landing. So we were ETOPS a lot, as opposed to where you're supposed to be. So a lot of aircraft operators couldn't do it, just legally couldn't do it. And uh, luckily, Qatar got an exemption for doing it, and they did such great planning. We had lots of options of what to do for most of it. There was a small window in which things would have got a bit tricky if we'd lost an engine or depressurized, but... Uh, we made it through okay. And, and there, there was a period where you were off comms, wasn't there? Yes, the poles isn't, aren't well covered. Both North and South Pole are not well covered by satellite coverage. So we did have uh, an area of darkness in terms of comms um, all the way over the top of the earth and a large one over the south. Yeah. But the, U, the US military actually did scramble some satellites, move them around a bit so we had better coverage. And that was thanks to Janneke. Janneke is amazingly... Uh, capable technically and very persuasive. She got hold of some generals of the US military who somehow got excited about this uh, through her and she got them to move satellites. So about a week before they started doing whatever you do to move military satellites. So we had extra comms over Antarctica. We didn't have 100% coverage, but we had a lot better coverage because yeah. we were streaming the cabin through three HD feeds to uh, to the live, the live feed around the world. And people were gradually tuning into it and getting interested in it. And I think at one, at one point, she was absolutely surprised herself at the quality of, 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 of the connection. Mm. Yes, it was amazing. We were getting three megabits, even four megabits upload, uh, which is very unusual. Download's one thing, but upload is usually much lower on satellites. And um, that, this was in Marsat, uh, did, a, did a great job. Um, Satcom Direct, in Marsat. They combined to give us tremendous capability, uh, priority bandwidth. And um, I'm not sure how any airliner near us would have got on. They might have not, not have had much bandwidth. But uh, when we were going through any particular area, we got uh, priority coverage. And uh, we were able to do HD streaming from an aircraft, which doesn't normally happen, especially three HD feeds. Yeah, no, it's amazing, amazing. So, right, five years, you decided to do it. You got your support. 
the chief stepped in. So then now, how did you pick the crew and the international uh, mix? What made you choose who you did? How did you come to get those people involved? Well, originally it was going to be Buzz Aldrin was going to be the uh, keynote astronaut on board because we we're celebrating Buzz's own landing on the moon 50 years before. So yeah, it was logical. Yeah. And he wanted to be on it. Absolutely. He was 100% um, in, in it. But in the end, his health at age, uh, it was 89 um, years old, was just not quite, not quite up to nearly 48 hours in a small tube going around the planet. And that was partly because of the last adventure we went on together, which, um, while it was was successfully successful on paper, actually didn't end too well. And um, we we both went to the South Pole together. I, I'd been talking to Buzz about going to the South Pole for about a decade before we went there. And um, our original plan was to drive across Antarctica in some Hummers, and that wouldn't have go, gone well at all. Now I now know enough about Antarctica to know we would have fallen into a crevasse and not got out. Hummers are the worst thing you could do, probably drive across Antarctica in. Um, but anyway, that was the plan originally. But finally, we, we went there another way, and um, in in December 80, uh, 2016, we were there at the South Pole, and uh, unfortunately, Buzz had. Um, a medical problem, blood oxygen level went to 70%. Uh, he, his heart was having a problem and he collapsed literally 50 meters from the South Pole. And um, uh, initially we were trying to get him out ourselves using our own methods, but that wasn't going to work. And so in the end, we had to declare a full-scale emergency. And the US military at first said, no, no we can't help people. We don't, we don't do tourist recovery in Antarctica. And then, and, uh, but then they realized who it was and it was one of their top heroes in the world. And they scrambled all resources they had in Antarctica. All of the US military resources were made available to us. They got a C-130 into the South Pole, picked him up there. All the doctors from the Amundsen Scott Research Center there were put on board the C-130. It flew to a McMurdo US base on the coast of Antarctica, where they had a C-17 uh, waiting to a jet to take him to um, Christchurch. So about 10 hours after the incident at the South Pole, he was in intensive care in Christchurch. And that saved his life, I think, because uh, it would have taken days to get him out with the resources we had at our disposal. And, and, uh, sorry, and the thing is, he was 86 when he went on that challenge. Yeah, yeah, he, it, it was actually a new world record. So uh, I suggested to the editor of Guinness, they actually recorded that this year, as, as well as our record. They, they put Buzz in the uh, Guinness Book of Records this year as the oldest person in the South Pole which is quite a cheat, but he's got a few other records as well. But, I was uh, going to say, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, so it's not his biggest record. But um, uh, anyway, that, that was the original plan. So, it, so given that Buzz couldn't do it from a health point of view, um, despite having planned it for years, yeah. we, uh, I got to know over a number of years um, the amazing astronaut uh, Colonel Terry Burtz, who uh, was the International Space Station commander and also a, a shuttle pilot so he landed the space shuttle not everybody lands the space shuttle lots of people go on it over the years but uh, landing it is a bit more interesting and uh, it's a very heavy glider and so he'll tell you about that i'm sure in the other podcast you're doing with him yeah and um he's he's just an ama amazing guy he 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 became our nasa contact he got us into the uh, shuttle landing facility itself where we took off and landed because he's nasa himself and NASA embraced this project. So we were doing it from the historic location of Apollo 11. And then he he knew Janneke very well. So he brought her in on the technical side. I brought in Qatar executive who couldn't have been a better partner. They are so professional. And I'm also a G650 captain myself. So I was one of the captains on it and I got inducted into Qatar executive as one of their captains for the purposes of this mission. So I had a Qatari license and... Um, ah and uh, got inducted in all their procedures in Doha to make sure I was, I was equally qualified for their procedures and um, insurance. And they provided three other captains. So there were four captains all together with myself and we, we took it in turns up front. So it was 50% on, 50% off, because obviously you have two crews. So it was two, yeah. two captains um, up front and uh, two resting in principle, but the resting didn't happen quite so well because there was interviews with Addison Cooper on CNN and schools interviews and, and just general excitement of the whole thing. It's very hard to sleep when, when the adrenaline's running like that. Um, and then the rest of the crew where we had uh, Qatar executives, top engineer, um, engineer for um, the G650 um, and um, probably top, top flight attendant, Magdalena, 
Yep. So the um, and and Gennady, the astronaut from the from Russia. So we wanted we wanted it to be an international thing. So all the nationalities on board um, were were pretty amazing, and we had a different nationality of each member of the crew. And Gennady is probably the most famous of the current generation of Russian cosmonauts. He's got the most days in space, nearly three years total in space. Terry's a relative junior with only about seven months in space. Um, so he holds the world record. If, if a lot of world records involved. He was, was the world it's record holder. Thing. I think you're, you're talking to him shortly. Yeah. And uh, he holds the world record, as he will very modestly tell you. Um, he doesn't, doesn't boast at all. And uh, uh, so many days in space. And um, so he, he picked him up in Kazakhstan, since that's also a launch site for all the, uh, all the um, Soyuz program, which Terry was also on. Terry, Terry's a Russian speaker as well, despite being an American. And uh, he went up in the Soyuz to the International Space Station. And that's how he got to know Gennady, because Gennady was up there at the same time as Terry was the commander. My God, and um, he, spe he speaks Russian as well. Yes, yes, he's amazingly talented. He had to, to do Soyuz, you have to, from a safety point of view, you have to be able yeah, to speak yeah. Russian because it's all controlled in Russian. My goodness me. And he also directed the documentary film. Yeah, he, he's amazingly uh, talented. Um, I've been very lucky in life to meet a lot of the top astronauts, uh, most of the Apollo program uh, astronauts that are still around and a lot of other space shuttle astronauts. And they're all very impressive, hugely impressive test pilots, PhDs, um, they're, they're, they're everything and they're amazing. But to do a transition straight into sort of business and into film, uh, that, that is probably unique. I've never seen anybody do it so effectively from the military uh, test pilot astronaut world into film directing. Terry did an amazing job of directing this movie and I've seen him on stage. He's, he's incredible in front of cameras as well. But he did he did such a he did such a good job because there were so many subtleties in the in the film. You know, there was a, a little bit of drama, you know, then there was camaraderie, then there was a bit of humor, then it went back to the IOC in Doha and they were looking at what they were doing and how they were planning and prepping, and it was fantastic. And the one of the loveliest bits for me was the way they filmed your son talking about you, as Giles, talking about oh, yes. you. And the way he said, I, I, I think he said he wanted to be a rugby player, but if he didn't, he'd like to be like his dad and, and do all these adventures and everything. Well, I think he actually said he would take over my company, um, that's, that's, that's uh, has, has worried me a bit. Uh, I'm, I'm having to sort of look over my shoulder at the moment to make sure he doesn't take over my company too soon. I, yeah. quite, like, I quite like running my own company at the moment. But, you know, if, you know how it is uh, back in the Middle Ages, the uh, young prince would, would overthrow the king and take the throne. So... Yeah, I don't yeah, know what may, what may happen soon. In fact, he's just over there doing his homework right now. Yeah. No, but that was a lovely. That was lovely, and the way he spoke about it. I mean, he was he was wise beyond his years, obviously. And, yes. uh, and then to see the other end of the spectrum was to see Colonel Vince's uh, dad talking about how proud he was and how yet how worried he was when he first went up into space. Yes, yes, uh, that that is actually real adventure. I mean, a G six fifty is pretty safe. We were doing. We were stretching the limits of a G650, but uh, going up in a space shuttle, as has been sadly proved on two occasions, is not the safest thing in the world. So that is a lot more, yeah. lot more adventurous, a lot more worrying for family. Yeah, yeah. And, but there was a little bit of, what do you call it, drama or danger during, during your particular um, exercise, whereby you either had, you had to come down in altitude and go faster, or it was because of the time difference and what was happening there, yeah? Um, yes, there were a lot of things actually that went against us on the, the third sector. The other three sectors were, were good. We were pushing the envelope of speed and, and everything, getting everything right, but they were all within our general control. Everything went to plan. But the third sector, which was the most difficult one, it was always going to be, that was from Mauritius down to the South Pole, turn right and head towards Chile. And um, that one was right on the limits of what the aircraft could do uh, in terms of range. And obviously, we wanted to keep the yeah. speed up to, to beat the record. And so it was a, a real compromise. And we hit a temperature that we were not expecting. The forecasting is not perfect over Antarctica because people don't fly over that very often. In fact, nobody flies over, the, over Antarctica. We were, a, we were a good thousand miles or probably 2,000 miles away from the nearest aircraft as we went over the pole that, that July. And... Um, 
as we went over the pole, we were at about minus 80 centigrade at um, flight level 430, 43,000 feet. Yeah. And that is actually the limit temperature wise for a Gulf Stream. Gulf Streams cannot go be below minus 80 centigrade in the air. Otherwise, something may go wrong. We don't know what, but when you have a limit on an aircraft, you, you don't want to exceed it because you, you're, you become a test pilot. And, and so we had to come down from 4430. Uh, down, down about 5,000 feet in order to regain limits because we went to minus 83. I, I was up front at the time flying and I remember watching minus 80, then minus 81, minus 82, minus 83. At minus 83, about uh, 15 minutes past the South Pole, we decided that was quite cold enough and so we descended. You yeah. don't have to ask air traffic control over Antarctica. There's, there's no conflict. You just do what you like, really. And so we went down 5,000 feet and... Uh, we carried on. But the trouble is, the lower altitude you go, the more fuel you burn for the same yeah. speed. So we started getting much tighter on fuel. And coming into Punta Arenas in the south of Chile in the middle of winter is also not a great place to go because it's wet, cold and dark. It was the middle of the night, pitch black. Uh, the weather was coming down to minimums and the ILS was out. So we were down to a non-precision approach into Punta Arenas with the weather coming down sort of two minimums or below. And uh, a divert airfield, while we did have a technical divert, we would have had a lot of trouble landing in the middle of the night in Argentina when they weren't expecting you and asking, could we have a really quick refuel, please, uh, would have been a problem. I'm sure it would have screwed the record completely. So we, we, we actually um, did, did make sure we landed in Punta Arenas. It was, it was tight, but we were, we were determined to land that, that time. That was, a, that was a, we're going to land this one. So apart from apart from such temperatures and and turning fuel into jello or jelly, then so, you also had a you also had a, a challenge where you were given a decision to fly over an active volcano. Oh yes, yes, uh, that was actually a good move. It did cut uh, did cut some time off the flight, and uh, it it was determined that although aircraft were not normally allowed over it, the current eruption at that time was only to about twenty five thousand feet. And of course, the Gulf Stream goes over in the 40s. So we were considerably above the current eruption of the volcano when we went over. And it was, unless it suddenly erupted more violently, we were, we were probably going to be okay. okay so, yeah. It was a surprise. I didn't know about it at the time. They just rooted us there. And, uh, and we found out later it was because of a volcano being assessed as being semi-safe. Yeah, no, no, it was amazing. Now, from your perspective, so five years wanting to do it, you've obviously got an adventurous streak in you, um, and you wanted to break the record, so you were determined. What was the what was the the biggest rewarding moment from you for you, apart from obviously breaking the record, which we're telling people now, but you did break the record, you're in the Guinness Book of Records. But what was the most rewarding part of the whole expedition, the whole challenge for you? I think we were actually very surprised that the world seemed to embrace this more than we expected. We, we thought we were just doing a fun little aviation record with some technical records, fastest average speed over a recognized course or something. It was all very exciting for us, but we didn't think the world would be very interested. But thanks to the live streaming, it was a complete yeah. surprise to us that schools got involved and everybody th thought it was rather, rather interesting. We, we even had a large number of flat earthers. We, we love flat earthers. They're great. Um, and uh, there was a massive argument on one of the channels about uh, the fact this must be a fraud. We, we were clearly a fraud because uh, uh, we were pretending to go over the North Pole, South Pole, when everybody knows the Earth is indeed flat and we couldn't possibly be going round the Earth. And so there was a massive debate, um, and that was actually quite interesting. I, I'm really very keen to meet some flat earthers and, and debate the subject myself. I've never actually met a live flat earther. No, that might be, uh, that might be very entertaining. That might be worth watching. Now, <laughs> Can I ask you another thing? And obviously the, 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 the chief will be pleased about this and so will all the other private aviation enthusiasts. The, the uh, Gulfstream, the G650, why was that aircraft chosen? Well, it is the most capable of all the business jets out there at the moment. It's got 7,500 nautical mile range in the yeah. ER version, the extended range version. And it does go Mach 925, 0.925 that is. Yeah. And uh, so 92.5% of the speed of sound gives you tremendous capability. And uh, so one, one of the interesting things is you actually want to go as low as possible to be able to break a record. People don't realize that. Normally aircraft go high to save fuel yeah. and cruise at normal speeds. But actually, when you're going to record, 
the speed of sound is higher at sea level yeah. than at altitude. So technically, if we could have done it, we would have done best at sea level. If we'd done the whole record at sea level, 92.5% of the speed of sound at sea level would have been very fast in knots and speed over the ground. But of course, we would have run out of fuel very soon. And so you have to go up to a medium level. So we did most of the record in the 30s, whereas a Gulfstream nearly always flies in the 40s yeah. in terms of thousands of feet. Uh, we did in 30 thousandths of feet. And uh, that gave us a faster actual speed of the ground where we still still were the same muck number. So muck 909192, whatever we, we were doing at that particular time. And we were following very precise instructions from, from Doha. They were micromanaging the whole thing, exactly the right altitude for that particular moment to get the best tailwind, to get the best speed over the ground effectively, and the best temperatures. Because of course, temperature affects your, your ability to achieve certain speeds. Uh, and of course, weather, we have to be rooted around any bad weather where you have to slow down if you go into, if you go into um, any, any bad turbulent air. So th there was a, a lot of planning that went into this, some of which we saw, some of which we didn't. But the Doha Control Center was doing a tremendous job of giving us new instructions all the time, desperately trying to cut seconds off our yeah. time on, at every stage. Yeah, no, it was incredible. I was watching and obviously I've, I've done some uh, emergency response training exercises over there and also with the chief because he he goes to them all and he is so 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 focused you know oh yeah dare not, you dare not have have the wrong information or do something wrong it's incredible but it was oh, yeah it was a bit nostalgic there looking back on that now the other thing that you had to do was you had to be very careful of your weight Yes, uh, we, we were right on the limit uh, of leaving. And Qat Qatar is very precise on their safety. So although this was a serious record, with everything was calculated very closely so as not to exceed limits or to uh, put the aircraft in any jeopardy. So we had to be within a few pounds of the max gross takeoff weight yeah. of the aircraft when we left on the initial departure. And... Um, we still needed full fuel because uh, the first sector was quite a long one. It was straight from Florida over the North Pole all the way down to the middle of Kazakhstan. That is quite a long trip. And um, so we needed full fuel, but we needed all of the provisions on board for the whole trip. We went re refilling water or fuel as we were at, went round. There wouldn't have been time. Yeah, no, it's amazing. And 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 the other thing that the other thing that I notice as well is when you see the 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 uh, G six fifty. In the cabin, it looks, I mean, you, you guys looked as if you had plenty of space, plenty of comfort. You had the bed there as well. I mean, I, I, I'm pretty sure it wasn't used that much because, like you said, you were all on, full of adrenaline and, and, and communications with everywhere. But it's a, it's a lovely aircraft, huh? Oh, it is. It's a superb aircraft. Um, I've flown it for quite a number of years now, and I just love the G650. It's, uh, it is the best business jet out there. And uh, I love the the crew rest compartment. That's probably the nicest room. There's a little, tiny little room in the front that has just enough space for a flat bed. Yeah. So you have a seat which goes fully flat and that's the crew rest. You can close the door and uh, have total peace and quiet and one window looking out on, on, the, uh, on the world from there, which is it's a very nice, relaxing place to rest if you're operating a heavy crew. That's three or four crew. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Tough old task. And the, uh, talking about crews, the, the ground crews where you did your stops. I mean, it was so, it was a little bit funny, but it was also lovely to see how enthusiastic they were with the fueling, where you've got the, the fueler, he was pulling the hose and trying to get it on as quick as possible. It looked like somebody, you know, trying to trying to audition for the Formula One pit stop team. It, it was amazing. E each of the three refuel centres were competing with each other to have the fastest pit stop. Yeah. And, um, Qatar once again had gone above and beyond. They actually sent two G650 captains to each refuel location simply to manage the refuel. I mean, captains in G650 are very senior people in the business yeah, aviation yeah. world, yeah. very expensive individuals, very senior. And they, uh, they had two in each location. That's six captains out there in the field who flew in commercially just simply to manage it because we had to make sure that everybody had the right things in place. You can't sort of taxi in somewhere and find the refuel point is just too far to, for the for the refueling tanker to plug into the ground and then connect to the aircraft. So everything had to be practiced beforehand, and the captains knew what they were doing, obviously, and they had it all down to a T. So as we taxied in, everybody just went straight onto the aircraft with the pressure refueling and the other things, and, and basically uh, turned us around extremely quickly. 
Yeah, no, it was amazing. And and they must have felt so proud as well when they when they got the results in. But when you said about the um, the most difficult sector, and that's also, isn't it, where the um, the incident of the human waste and the pipes frozen and the poor gentleman who got a little bit of a surprise he wasn't expecting. Oh yes, yeah that 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 was that was amazing. Um, yes, he 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 managed to um, uh, get get covered in some rather smelly stuff because the toilet did did actually um, did get completely uh, frozen up at minus eighty three centigrade. It was too too much uh, too long. It was fully cold soaked, and so um, it it got blocked. And then it did all come out in Punta Arenas in Chile. So. Um, um, so he did get, he did get, uh, Ben got uh, caught in that. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, also you brought a little bit of tactical politics into it to make sure you were able to get access to certain airspace. Um, oh, yes, the, we were very lucky in Russia, where uh, luckily we had um, a Russian, um, Russian member with, of the crew, or he's actually Ukrainian, but he spoke Russian, and he was able to explain um, uh, what was going on with the record and the fact we were going to pick up Gennady. Uh, Gennady Padalka is a Russian hero in the cosmonaut world, and so he he was uh, coming on board for one sector as a guest astronaut between um, Astana and Mauritius. And so once they heard that one of their most famous astronauts was coming aboard, they did give us direct, because Russia's not super flexible with direct yeah. routings. They tend to like you to fly through the official airways, which aren't very direct. But finally, um, Yevgen managed to, managed to get us uh, the direct routings, which certainly cut some time off the record. Yeah, I thought that was incredible. And I bet, I bet uh, poor old Gennady, he would have liked to have carried on. But obviously the weight restriction yeah. was... Uh... We, we had eight people circumnavigate the planet. Uh, that was the limit we felt for weight purposes. We would have had to cut fuel if we'd had another person on board. Not by very much, but um, if you think of one person and baggage might be 100 kilos, 100 kilos of fuel does matter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing, huh? So, now, as you, as you went through all of, those, all of those little blips and all of those little challenges, was there at any point you thought you might not make it? Um, we, we didn't really think about it. Uh, it. It was a question of what do we have to do next? What's the next problem? And so we never really thought about it. But um, Antarctica was just so exciting. I, I was lucky enough to do both poles. I, I think I managed the schedule so that uh, I was up front for North Pole and South Pole. Uh, and that, those were probably the highlights in a way. Um, watch, watching the, uh, the compass swing round really fast as you transition the pole is, is, is an amazing experience that you don't normally get. Yeah. And um, so the going into Punta Arenas was concerning because uh, obviously as the weather was going below minimums, uh, there was a worry that we would have to divert. So we, shoot, we shot the approach and uh, we did manage to get in, but if it got much worse, it was, it was getting tight. Luckily, the G650 has a lot of safety features. You've got enhanced vision. So you've yeah. got a head-up display in front of you, and you've got an infrared camera forward-looking, uh, looking out at the lights of the runway. So it gives you an artificial picture, even through, through a low-level cloud. You can actually see the runway through infrared. So you've got a lot of things to help you get in. But um, on a non-precision approach, the minima are quite high. My goodness me! It's, in, it's I mean, that's the, that's the thing for me. I've 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 worked in aviation for 41, 42 years, and I've been around aircraft. I've got I've got a couple of brothers who love aircraft. One of my brother's sons is absolutely mad for it. So when he watches your film, he's going to be just glued to the box. It's incredible. But I never took I never took enough interest in aircraft. You know, I've I've been on them. I was flying, I don't know, two, three times a week at some points, and I've been all over the world, lived in most places, but I absolutely loved the film for everything that it showed, you know, how how, it, how much experience, professionalism, coordination, collaboration, everything about a team without, without physical contact. I've always enjoyed, um, you know, sports, rugby, football, American football, et cetera. But to see you guys when you landed all together, and that common 
that I don't know what it was that that you, you just all looked so special together. It, it was amazing. It, it worked fantastically. I mean, from a movie point of view, we should have had some conflict because um, if you want to make a movie exciting, there should be a love triangle. Um, and um, well, you know, yeah, reality TV, the, the crew should have been fighting with each other over who who was who 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 Magdalena or Yannicka loved the most or something. And we should have had massive confrontation, you know, like um, like in these reality shows. Um, what's the one where you ever get thrown out of the house? Um, I can't remember now. Oh but, yeah, yeah, um, um, yeah. I don't tend to watch them, but um, Big Brother. Famous. Yeah, Big Brother. That's it. There should have been a Big Brother love interest or something, but we just were so busy doing it. There was uh, really no time for any conflict or love interest. The crew got on so well, we we couldn't really generate any artificial conflict for the movie. No, it was brilliant. Honestly, it was so good. And also a couple of uh, the, the, the points where you had the live feed with the children in, in the different schools. That was superb. Yeah, that, that was amazing. Uh, my, one of my staff, uh, Tyler Clam, who was a former teacher, he, he set all that up. It was his idea, in fact. We, we, didn't need, we were so busy just trying to make the thing happen. It never yeah. even occurred to us to do that. But it was his idea as a former teacher. Why not talk to schools, representative schools from each of the locations we landed in, plus the plus the U.S. Um, near nearby Cape Canaveral? So there were four different schools um, link-ups on the live video, which worked very well in the movie, and and uh, we were surprised once again the schools embraced it so enthusiastically. And several several schools I know have um, have actually watched it now as a school. We gave some advanced releases of the movie to uh, yep. my my lawyer in in London, uh, Ebro Sullivan, she, she actually showed it to um, her kids' school, in fact, and uh, they, they, they loved the whole movie. So that, that was pretty amazing. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. So I, I think we should probably say where people can, can get access. So obviously there's www.onemoreorbit.com and then there's the video on demand. Yes, the, the, it's now available in most channels. It's, it's a strange thing I discovered uh, recently. I've only got into the Hollywood world recently. It's, um, I funded the movie as executive producer. Executive producer doesn't mean you have any skill. It means you, you funded it, basically. But um, I had a little bit of input, but there were much better people than me actually putting it together. And, but anyway, I've learned about the Hollywood way of doing things. And there's now so many distribution channels. It's incredible. We appointed Vision Films as our distributor because it's way beyond our ability to work out how to distribute movies. Yeah. So they put it out on all the video on demand channels. And there's different ones all over the world, but the, the obvious ones are Amazon, um, iTunes, Hulu, um, and a load of other ones which I didn't know too well. So you can, you can download those. And uh, the DVD itself will come out just before Christmas in 1st of December, 2020. And uh, that 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 will be that'll have some video extras. We just did some DVD extras because yeah. uh, th those were those were my interest points. We did a lot of air to air footage, which only some of which got into the movie. So we managed to put another ten minutes of uh, unique air to air footage on the DVD as one of the extras. And that was we were allowed the day after we got into Cape Canaveral the record. NASA was so fired up about it. They said, "Oh yeah, no problem. Go off and do what you like over our area." which they never allow people to fly over low level over Cape yeah, yeah, yeah. doing their own thing. Anyway, we were allowed to do that the next day with a Starfighter, which is F-104 supersonic jet. So we scrambled that. It, it went round with um, the, it has, a, that, some of those Starfighters had two seats in them. Uh, some are one, but so, um, these, these are two. And so we had the pilot plus a cameraman behind him. We filmed the G650 flying over all these historic places like the BAB, um, which is the vehicle assembly plant and um, vehicle assembly building. And that's where the space shuttle was put together. Apollo 11 was put together. Um, and also the launch pads, 39A, 39B, which are the famous launch pads at Cape Canaveral for all the big launches. And um, there's some amazing footage. And also from us doing the supersonic jet from our cabin, we were videoing the supersonic jet. So it's amazing air-to-air -air footage that... Uh, that I was particularly interested in as a pilot. And so that, that, that could only really get into the DVD because uh, there wasn't enough time to put it all in the movie. There's some good stuff in the movie. Yeah, and then great. I, I was lucky enough to get to fly the jet the next day. So as well, I managed to uh, get a bit of a jolly in the F-104 Starfighter and I, I was able to fly it supersonically, which is a first. I've been in the Concorde once, 
but that was a passenger, obviously. And this time I was actually able to advance the throttle to a different different um, segment, which is afterburner. And once you get to afterburner, you go supersonic. So we went supersonic over the ocean, where you're allowed to do it in America, just not over oh, land. God. What an incredible experience. I, I will definitely be getting that DVD for my nephew, Liam. I, I know he's going to love it. And I just want to finish now with what's next. Um, well, we we um, were trying to do various other records. I was trying to do one this year, but it got rather um, COVIDed out. Because yeah. a little project I was I was doing was to try and go to the bottom of the um, Mariana Trench. At the time when I was planning it, there had only been seven people who on Earth who managed to make it to these minus thirty six thousand feet under the ocean. It's uh, it's lower down in the ocean than Everest is above the ocean. And um, there's only one submarine in the uh, world that can get there, owned by a chap called Victor. He's also in the Guinness Book of Records, same Guinness Book of Records, about uh, 10 pages later, his submarine and all his achievements are in the same book. That's well worth looking at. So I was just, I was signed up to go with him in May, but the chance of getting out of Dubai and getting back in again, getting to Guam was pretty low. So we we actually postponed it. I hope to do that at some point. But now it's up to 11 people in the world, I think, who've gone down. He did do a trip with a whole lot more people, and I missed out on it sadly. But hope to hope to get there. Got to find a record. And I was hey, thinking you got to find most, a record. most number of hours below most number of hours in a trip below ten thousand meters was, was one that I think could be could be got. And what sort of training will you have to do for that? Um, they, they 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 give you some training on the submarine and also operating the arm because it's a scientific mission as well. So you're actually uh, you have this arm that sort of drops down and picks up some something off the bottom of the sea. And there really are life forms down there at 36,000 feet below and a thousand atmospheres pressure. So somehow things still manage to live at a thousand atmospheres. Complete darkness. Absolutely amazing. So you love a bit of adventure. What do the boys, what do the boys think of all this, Rory and Giles? Um, I owe Rory a, a trip. Um, I promised him the North Pole because I've taken Giles to the South Pole. In January this year, Giles became the youngest person to reach the South Pole. So I managed to do the, the oldest with Buzz, youngest with my son Giles. Um, and I, took the, uh, I managed to take the first Nigerian to the South Pole. Is a great a good friend of mine, uh, Prince Ned Nwoko, who, who um, is a, quite a character in Nigeria. And he, anyway, he became the first Nigerian to reach the pole as part of his mission to uh, promote the eradication of malaria in Africa. Oh, so yeah, 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 yeah. You might have seen might have seen some press on that, and uh, we unfurled a big banner at the South Pole saying, "Let's eradicate malaria in Africa." Um, I mean, luckily, Antarctica has pretty much wiped out malaria. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> I'm going to say, yeah, good starting point. So, so Rory's going to be heading for the North Pole soon. That that is the idea. COVID has rather thrown the adventuring out of the window at the moment, but uh, you really want to do North Pole in April, typically. So I'm not sure if things will be back to any level of normality by April next year. I suspect not, but uh, we may see if we can do it in in April. And he knows he's going, does he? I have, I have told him. He, he's owed a trip because uh, he's missed he's missed a few of the other adventures. Yeah. So while the pair of you are away heading for the North Pole, Giles will probably be taking over the business. Yeah. Yeah. I got to watch that. <laughs> Listen, Captain Hamish, absolutely fantastic. It's such a privilege to meet somebody who's done so much. And like I said, I was so entertained. I learned a lot and I, it really gave me a, a, a nice feeling afterwards. It was a lovely, lovely film. So hats off right. to you all. Right. Thanks very much indeed, Chris. Much appreciated. Really, really good. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chris.